Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Paul writes, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so Paul is at this point in Romans, here in what we call chapter 5, he is outlining the benefits of being saved, the benefits of salvation. Now, in chapter 4, Those of you who were with us in chapter 4, we saw that Paul was writing to this church, the church in Rome, about the doctrine of justification. I mentioned to you that as we looked at that, that the term justification is uh, is really a word that was during the time of Paul used in a judicial sense. It had it was in it was in relation to to crimes and penalties and things that related to that. And so what he was doing as he was speaking concerning justification is he was teaching the church how God makes a sinner into a Christian and a Christian righteous. So justification is God declaring a sinner, and I mentioned this to you, to be totally free of the guilt of sin. So it's through justification that God completely forgives us of our sin. He had said in chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So when we're justified, I mentioned to you something is removed. Well, that would be the penalty of sin. That would be judgment. But not only that, something is received. So something is removed, and that's the penalty. Something is received, and that's forgiveness. So through justification, God completely, as mentioned a moment ago, forgives sin. The Old Testament book of Isaiah 43, 25, he said it like this. God said, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Isaiah 55, verse 7, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous, their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. And so Paul has been speaking about that and now he's going to give us insight into the life we now have in Jesus Christ. And so he begins in verse 1, and he says, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The immediate result of being justified is reconciliation with God. I've shared this with you. I'll share some more in a moment. But we, at one time, were in opposition. We were his enemies. But we have been reconciled, these two warring parties, have now come to peace with one another. So we were at one time at war with God, and God was angry at us. Uh, In Romans chapter 8, we'll get there in about six months. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, it says, The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it it, it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. What he says he desires and commands, we say, no, I don't care. And so that's the point. We are in opposition. We are hostile towards him. But when we believe the gospel, the war that we had with our God came to an end. And his message is that which gives us the terms of peace. It's called the gospel, and it calls for unconditional surrender. So when we yielded and repented and sought his mercy... God forgave us. So we're no longer at war with him. We're in a state of peace with him. We're reconciled to him. In Acts 10, 36, it reads, You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And so when you gave your heart to Christ, you are now at peace with God. The war is over. You've surrendered. He is your God. You are his servant. And now we have peace with him. And that results in a present tense sense of assurance. 
In 1 John 4, 17 and 18, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness. That word boldness means a confident assurance. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, as he is righteous, so are we in this world. There is no fear in, in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. When you gave your heart to Christ and the war is over, we're at peace with God, we receive peace from God, we no longer have fear of judgment. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. So this thought that, oh, I, I hope I can be right with God, I hope I can go to heaven, and there are some who actually still carry that within them. Today's society is a bit different than the generation I grew up in. The generation I grew up in, when I said to somebody when I first got saved, uh, I'm going to go to heaven, the immediate response that they gave was, you're not that good. So there was a time when people actually knew you had to have a certain kind of life. So when I said, I'm going to heaven, and I was a brand new Christian, maybe three weeks old in the Lord, and I said, I'm going to heaven, to me that was like, oh, it still is, it's amazing. But my friends immediately said, hey, well, we know you, you're not that good. If there's such a place as hell, it's got a room reserved for you, that kind of thing. But I didn't, I'm not going to heaven based on my righteousness. I'm going to heaven based on his. And that's what, that's what Paul is teaching. He, he's saying, you've been justified. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done. It, it's according to his mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's a work that God did. And see, that's the point that's being made here. And so when John was speaking about it, he said that we can have confident assurance in the day of judgment. When you stand before the Lord, in other words, you can know that he's going to welcome you in because you've gotten right with him. He's righteous and he's making us righteous here. And so there's no fear in love because fear is the opposite of love. I've said this recently, but I used to say, what's the opposite of, of love? And people would say hate. No, the opposite of love is fear. Because perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. So that's what causes people to have such anxiety. Because every day they grow older, they're one more step closer to death. I know that's a bummer to hear on this beautiful Wednesday night. But, it, but it's true. The longer you live, the closer you are to die. We know that. From the moment we were conceived, we began to die. We just weren't aware of it yet. And as you grow older, you become more and more aware of it. Every time you get up in the morning and you kind of try and get, you know you're dying, and that's a fact. So our bodies tell us that, even if our mind resists the idea. So that's the peace that every person longs for, and it only comes from surrender. Uh, I believe it was uh, Spurgeon who said, if any man is not sure that he is in Christ, he ought not to be easy one moment until he's sure. Dear friend, without the fullest confidence as to your saved condition, you have no right to be at ease. And I pray you may never be so. This is a matter too important to be left undecided. I hope that you never take your ease and think everything's smooth because the fact is it's not. You're moving one step closer to judgment and until you commit your heart to Christ, you'll never have peace. You'll only be seeking for it. but You'll never obtain it until it's received by faith through Christ. And so he's speaking concerning this in verse 1. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so we now have access by faith. That word access is acceptance. We have acceptance by faith through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so we have access by faith uh, to, to a relationship with God and entrance into heaven. You see, before Christ, people could not have direct access to God because their sin made a separation. But when Jesus died, he tore the veil in the temple, and now access is ours. The sin that once separated us from God has been completely wiped away. That's why Hebrews 4.16 is so beautiful. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can with confidence now come before the Lord. Why? Because he made it possible for us through Jesus. That's what Paul's talking about. Now notice in verse 2 how he says the result of standing in grace is rejoicing in hope. The word rejoicing, uh, exulting, it, it speaks of a jubilance, a, a, a great excitement. We're excited because we know God. We're excited because we have a relationship with the God of the universe. And I still remember, again, the early days. I don't know that, that this has ever really left me. But I do remember when, uh, when I first was saved. I do remember the joy of salvation. I do remember that, that after praying with uh, the evangelist, a man by the name of Arthur Blessed, how that, it was like a weight rolled off my shoulders. I don't know another way to put it. It's like there was a burden that was now lifted, and, and my spirit was set free. There was a joy. And that's when I came home, and that's when I went across the street to speak to some neighbors to tell them I had committed my heart to Christ. The first people I went to speak to and to witness to, I was maybe three hours old in Jesus, was some neighbors who lived across the street. So I went across the street, and I told the mother, because the kids that I hung around with weren't home, I was supposed to get high with them that day. They had received a kilo from, from Thailand. And I was going to be celebrating Christmas two days later, you know, from Christmas. It's December 27th. And uh, I went in and I told him, I said, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ today. And uh, the mom, I, the mom knew I was a pothead. She knew that because her son was too. All her kids were. She may have been. But anyway, she. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was going to say something. I won't. Then I went home, and I walked into the, the den, and all of you who've heard my testimony know this. I, I stood at the, at the entrance to the den, the door. My mom, dad, two sisters watching TV, and they stood there. Mom, dad, Madeline, Becky, I love you. Praise the Lord. And uh, my sister Madeline came. I spoke to her about what happened. She gave her heart to Christ that night. She, Whatever you did for my brother, she said, please do for me. And so my sister got saved. And shortly after, a couple of years, I went into the military, came out. Uh, she led my girlfriend. Well, who wasn't even my girlfriend yet? She led Marie to Christ. And uh, the rest is history with that. The joy of salvation. The joy of salvation. Uh, it gives you such peace and it gives you such assurance. And that's what Paul is speaking about here. And he's saying that we rejoice it, it, it carries the connotation of actually, actually boasting in our confidence of our future. We know we're going to go to heaven, not based on anything we've done, but because of him. And we're going to share in the glory of God when Jesus rules and reigns. In, in John 17, Jesus was praying. They call it his high priestly prayer in John 17. And, and as he was praying, he spoke to his father and he said, The glory which you gave me. I have given them. So throughout eternity, we're going to share in joy and love and peace and holiness. Now, one day when we are glorified, we will receive and display the glory of God. Here's a scripture you might like, Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, actually, too. Our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself, will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. So take a look at your body right now. It's going to be nicer someday. <laughs> no more diets and no more working out and no more wearing black. <laughs> In, <laughs> right, John? In second <laughs> <laughs> in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so he's glorifying us, and that causes us joy, and one day we're going to see that. 
and it'll be a blessing. Now, as he speaks in that way, verse 3, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We know the future, and because our eyes are set on that which is yet to come, our future, we can glory in the difficulties that we experience as we await that time of being with him. So we can glory, he says, in tribulation. Now that word tribulations uh, is a word that can also be translated pressure or distress. Obviously, I'll say this briefly, but we all know this. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I'm exempt from suffering. I, uh, oh, I had hope so. I really did when I first got saved. I said, oh, it's going to be an everyday happy day. And it was for two weeks. <laughs> it was for years. Then I got married. You know, so... <laughs> So believers, we're not exempt from suffering. Now, there have been doctrines that have come out within the last several years. Many of you have heard of them. I don't want to go into them, but I will say that they basically have taught that every day is a great day because every day you get healthier and every day you get wealthier. There's a guarantee against every getting sick, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That doctrine is still going around. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says I can glory in the tribulations. I can grow through the afflictions. And that's how strength usually comes, isn't it? That's how strength of character is formed. It's through the crucible of, of affliction. That's where your faith is formed. When you're facing an opposition, you're standing at a Red Sea, and there's the Pharaoh's army behind you, and there's a sea in front of you, and there's no way to get across it. And then the Lord opens it and shows you that he is going before you. And, and though we may not ever stand before, and I pray to God I never, never am put to that challenge, but we may never go through a Red Sea experience where the waters have to part. Still, we know that were we in that place, our God is able to make a way of escape. We know that. And so we can actually rejoice and glory in the things that we go through, the distresses and the pressures. In Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And we learn that. So these are used to refine our faith and they form our character. Jesus in Matthew 10, 25 said, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. So if they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, the prince of flies, a devil, how much more shall they call them of his household? If they called Jesus' names, why would I expect that the world wouldn't speak of me in that way too? In John 16, Jesus said it like this. He said, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we glory, he says, we glory in tribulation. Because we know that God uses them to refine us. And we rejoice because hardships are evidence of faithful living, which is blessed and is rewarded. Again, in Romans 8, 18, Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I've had people in the past, perhaps you've said this, who have said, when I get to heaven, I've got some questions to ask God. One, no. No. Because then we shall know even as we are known. There are no questions in heaven, only answers. And so I'm not going to approach him and say, you know, back in January of 1958, how come, I'm not going to do that. You know, how come you did this? And how... That's not there. Why? Because we have learned, and this is really an important lesson to learn, 
that all things do work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. That, that's a truth. It doesn't look like, listen, if you're going through a bad time right now, I don't know your bad time, but I know the God who is the God of the bad time. And I know that God is able to not only use that, to make you into, but to make you into what you have been praying that you would be. Because he uses those things sometimes to take from us the things that don't matter and replace them with the things that do. Have you been praying, God, help me to love somebody? And then you discover that that's very hard to do because he brings somebody into your life that is difficult to love, and you have to call him husband? No, I mean, <laughs> have you discovered that? God, give us children. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> but have you, discovered, have you discovered that the things you go through are the stepping stones to the place you want to be? Have you discovered that? Because it's true. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I've asked him to do something in my life. But sometimes he'll do it in a way that I didn't expect. I thought it would be a safer or easier journey, and it turns out it wasn't. But the end is greatly satisfying. And so he'll bring us through those things. And so we develop a, a contented heart, a, a resigned, because we know God is in control, even a joyful heart. And so perseverance, tribulation produces this. And uh, second, it, it, it's, uh, rather, uh, secondly, perseverance forges character. Now character, when it uses the word character, that speaks of a character that has been tested or proven. It, it speaks of a character that has been revealed under fire. Like a Joseph in the Old Testament who was, uh, who was the uh, servant of a man named Potiphar. And the scripture speaks of him being a very handsome man. And Potiphar's wife made overtures to seduce him. Come lie with me, she said to him. And he said, how shall I sin against my master? I can't do such a thing. And, and we know the story of how he ran out of the room and she grabbed hold of his, his uh, garment he was wearing. And it came off in her hand and she accused him of rape. And he was put into prison for many years unjustly. He didn't attempt to do that. She lied, and uh, he was put away. And yet, the end of that was that he became second in command in the greatest nation at that time on the face of the earth, Egypt. So what didn't appear to be something that would turn out to be good actually taught him great lessons. It, it actually forged his character. In 1 Peter 1, 7, it says, The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So he's refining us and producing character in us, a proven character. Character leads to hope, to hope in God. So over time, as you're going through these things, you discover that God is faithful. And you discover that he keeps his promises. Psalm 95, 91, 15 says, He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And so you go through things. God makes a way of escape. God purges you of certain things because the fire of a trial has a tendency of purging things from you that are unacceptable. You come out refined like gold. The image of God is stamped upon your character. And as a result of that, you have a hope that is deeper, knowing that God is able to do those things to not only to deliver you, but to develop you. He goes on in verse 5, and he says, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So hope doesn't disappoint. The word hope, uh, again, it means to have a confident expectation or a trust. Hope is the result of grace, and, and hope actually increases over time. And he says, hope does not disappoint. Hope does not disgrace. Hope will not make you ashamed. Somebody said, a hope not based on the stability of God's promises leads to shame because the hope was placed in that which could not produce. But when your hope is in God, and God doesn't disappoint, God is able to do abundantly above all we could ask or think. Now, 
When I was a, a young person in faith, perhaps when we have been young in our faith, I know I said this. I, I said, I, I want to know what I believe. I want to know what I believe. So as a, a, a young Christian, I started buying books. Um, not many, but I bought books here and there. And I started reading because I wanted to know doctrine. I wanted to know what is the essential Christian faith? What, what is doctrine? So over time, I began to become more and more confident that I knew what I believed. And I think it's very important. That's why we're in Bible study right now, to know what we believe so that we look at the word of God and we can see how Paul is writing. I do my best to explain what that means. And so we, be, we come to a point of knowing what we believe. But there's something else. When we mature in faith, we not only say, I know what I believe, but what happens is you begin to say, I know whom I have believed. It's not just information. It's a person. It's not just information about that person. It's a relationship with that person, and that's different. In 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul said it like this. He said, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. It's not simply that I know what I believe, but I know the one who taught me those things. It's not that I just can say I know certain things about. You now can say I know him. That's, that's what we mean when we talk about that, that phrase, having a personal relationship with Christ. That's what we mean by that. You know, there, there have been people over the years, I remember again when I was a younger Christian, people would say, oh, these, these, these people who are calling themselves Jesus freaks, these Christians, you know, they, they say they have a personal relationship with Christ. And I still remember uh, somebody on TV saying, yeah, they've got a dating relationship with Jesus. They mocked us because we would use the term of knowing God personally. Because it's not just the information that saves you. It's the Im information it's information that is assimilated. It's information that's taken in. It's information that's taken in, assimilation, that produces a transformation. So we came to know the Lord, not just things about him, but we came to know him. We came to have a relationship with him. And that's why, that's why when you, you give your testimony, there are times that perhaps if you do, your heart sometimes gets overwhelmed. It's just like you start thinking. Nobody knows your testimony except you and God. We know that. There's the open testimony. We say, hey, can you give your testimony at a ladies' thing or at a men's conference? And you come up and you give your open testimony. And we sit there and I just go, wow, wow, man, you were, wow, I don't trust you anymore. No, we, <laughs> we, 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 hear, these, we hear these things, right? But you know when you're giving the testimony, you're not giving your complete testimony. You're only giving the things acceptable to say at that moment to those people. That's what you're doing. You're not giving your full testimony. You're giving a part of it. And you're giving some of it that is acceptable in a mixed group. But you've never given your whole testimony. Only God and you know what that one is. And so when you have that relationship with the Lord, then you know... My God has loved me, and he knows everything about me, and he still loves me. And that gives you an incredible, uh, incredible hope in God. It, it's established on the grace of God. In Psalm 71, verse 5, uh, you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. So the way that we live is evidence that our hope and trust is in God. All of us have at one time said, oh, I believe in the Lord, and you lived as if he didn't exist. There are those that they, they refer to some in that way, those who live that way, they call them practical atheists, meaning that though they may claim to have a, a knowledge of God, practically, they live as if there is no God. And there are quite a number of people, especially here in the United States, any place where the gospel has gone out and many people have responded in one form or another, 
But the genuine believer is someone whose hope is resting in God because of relationship with him. And so since our hope is in God, verse 5, it doesn't disappoint. It doesn't deceive us. Why? We have experienced the love of God. He said, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God's love has been poured out by the Spirit. Galatians 4 verse 6 says, because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts. The Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. That's a word that's really more tender than the simple word Father, though Father is a tender word. The word Abba is closer to Daddy. It's a tender word. And when the Spirit of the Lord has entered into our life, it changes this sense that there's a distant one who has now become close to me like a daddy is to a child. In Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, we are God's children. So hope doesn't disappoint. When he says hope does not disappoint, it, it, hope does not produce shame. Why? Well, God loves us. The shame of disappointment never results from our having hope. Isaiah 12, verse 12, the writer Isaiah says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and, and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. And so he wants to develop this with us further when he says in verse 6, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So look at how he's putting this now in verse 6. We were still without strength, but in due time Christ died. We were without strength. That means we're powerless. We were powerless to save ourselves. We were powerless to be able to please him in any way. When we looked at Ephesians recently, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Paul said it like this. He said, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And so we were without strength. There's not a single thing we could do to save ourselves. Nothing. We were locked into a room with no door, no window, no escape. We we're incapable of saving ourselves. We need to understand that. Because sometimes we have residue within us. Oh, I, I could say, no, you could never save yourself. That's the whole point of salvation. Because I was incapable of it. I was locked into sin. I walked in darkness. That was my nature. I needed salvation. But what did God do? Verse 6, he said, in due time, in the appointed time, he says, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the wicked. In Galatians 4, verse 4, it says, when the set time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. For scarcely, verse 7, for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. So scarcely for a righteous man. What is a righteous man? According to the way that they would uh, consider righteousness during the day of Paul, a righteous man would be a, a, an openly devout or a very religious man. That's a righteous man, a religious person. When he speaks of a good man, a good man is what we today would simply say that's a good guy. 
So for a righteous man or for a good man. Now, obviously, the world needs more of these. So perhaps, perhaps you might die for them. If somebody has a need for an organ and you have that organ, I rather doubt that I would do this, but let's pretend for a moment. <laughs> you have what they need. Well, perhaps for a righteous man, you'd dare to die. The story is told of a, a little girl who is in need of a, a transfusion. She was going to have an operation. And her blood type was so rare, they couldn't locate a donor. So as they normally do, they tested the family and they discovered that her brother had the same rare blood type. So they approached the little boy, he was just a little guy, and said to him, honey, could you give some of your blood to your sister? And the little boy thought for a moment, and then he said, okay. okay. And so they took him to the room, and they hooked him up, and they were taking out a certain amount, not, not, not that much, but a certain amount. But as they were hooking him up, he turned and looked at his mom, and he says, when does it happen? And the mama said, when does what happen? And he said to her, when do I die? Because he had made up his mind that he'd give all of his blood to his sister. You know, isn't that sweet? Thank you, I made that up. No, um, <laughs> I know. No, that's an old story. But the point is well made. No, honey, you're not giving all of your blood up. You're not dying. Well, scarcely for a righteous or a good person, maybe you would. Maybe you would. Maybe you would say, the world needs more of them, and, and I will. Well, and that's the point he's making right now. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, even for a good man. But God, in verse 8, demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God demonstrates his own kind of love. We were yet sinners, he says. The word sinner speaks of someone who's detestable or depraved. That's the word there. We were slaves to sin. We were under its power, living in guilt, he's saying, awaiting righteous judgment. But God exhibited his own kind of love for us, and he revealed it. He showed it on the cross in 1 John 4, 9, and 10, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He goes on in verse 9 to say, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We've been saved from wrath that is revealed in the final judgment. In John 3.36, Jesus said, or it reads, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've been justified by his blood through his sacrifice. And then again in verse 10, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So we'll look at this. We were enemies. The, enemy, the word enemy means to be hateful. It speaks of being an adversary. It speaks of being hostile. So Paul is selecting certain words, and we'll look at them for just a moment as we're going to close in a second. But Paul is using certain words to magnify the amazing grace of God. Look at how he describes people without the Lord. He speaks of them as being without strength. They're incapable of saving themselves. He speaks of them as being ungodly, which is, again, the word wicked. 
He speaks of them as being sinners, which are depraved. He speaks of them as being enemies, who are his adversaries. We are without strength. We are ungodly. We are sinners. And we are God's enemies. So those who say, oh, no, I, I love God and I, you know, I'm a spiritual person. That's a, that's a pretty popular word. It became popularized a while back now. But that's how many Americans describe themselves. Instead of referring to themselves as, as a religious uh, person like a Christian or, or Jewish or Muslim or for whatever, whatever, they'll just say I'm spiritual. It's, it's uh, that word that kind of... Uh, just connotes this, I believe in another, I believe in a God of some sort or some power, some higher power, whatever. But the Bible says that, no, that we're, we, are, we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of God's glory. That there's none righteous, he says, no, not one. That, that we have certain characteristics, this is what describes an unbeliever. We're, we're unable to save ourselves, we're incapable of doing that, we we, we are ungodly. We act as if God doesn't exist, and thus we live a wicked life. We, we are sinners. We're depraved. We, we do one thing, and, and then we get used to it, and the shock is, is, is over, and then we'll go even further. Think of that for a moment in a practical way, and I don't want you to go back there too deeply. But the first time you did something, it probably violated your conscience. You knew it was wrong, and it may have even caused a bit of pain in your heart for doing it. Whatever it may have been. You know you shouldn't have done it, but you did it. And then when you did it, you were shocked that you could. But the next time it was a little easier. And the next time it was even easier. And after a while, it just became you. It became your habit. So at one time, what shocked you, you became callous to later on. The first time you were exposed to it, it bothered you. But later on, it became your habit. That's what sin does. Sin does that. You know that, and I know that. You violate your conscience. It becomes a little bit scarred. And callousness takes place. And, and before you know it, you have no more shame. As a matter of fact, you'll collect some people just like you. And you'll have a group of people you hang around with. You all agree that this is okay. And it becomes the okay amongst you. And then anybody who says they don't agree, well, they're judging you. And so what's the word they use today? So they cancel you. You're just, that's what happens. We see that. That happens. This may have happened to you. First time I smoked a cigarette, I smoked a camel. And it tasted like one. <laughs> Unfiltered. First time I took... You know, I, I, I drank whiskey. Uh, some of you have never had anything like that. Bless God. But the first time I did, oh, I mean, it took your breath away. But if you work at it for a while, it becomes your habit. It becomes your habit. It becomes who you are. And when you begin to play with sin, it becomes what you're known for. And before you know it, your friends will refer to you in that way because they know you as that. When I first got saved, my friend Bill said to, to me, I know you're saved. So how can you know I'm saved? You know, because it was like three weeks into it. How do you know I'm saved? Dave, you're saved. How do you know I'm saved, Bill? He says, you don't cuss anymore. Because I had a filthy, filthy mouth. I used to invent words to string together. Just to shock people. That's the truth. I really did. I had a coach in high school who said that I was the filthiest mouth kid he'd ever heard. And I lived up to it. And when he was around, I would string words together just to make that old man blush. I was 16 years old. 17. He was an old man. He had to be 40. <laughs> so you live up to that, right? You live up to the reputation. You live up to what people are saying you are. And you want to shock them. It becomes you. And so what happens is you become callous and, and conviction. You don't, even, you don't even sense shame anymore. That's what, that's what we were like. We were enemies of God. And God's word said, I love you. And you say, there's no God. God says, I can save you from what? 
That was our attitude. That's why he takes the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. You see, those who argue that man is good by nature, um, well, God would differ with that. Men are powerless. Men are wicked. He says they're depraved and they're his enemies. And if God didn't send his son, we all would receive the judgment that we deserve. But he says we've been reconciled through the death of Jesus Christ. In John 12, 32 and 33, Jesus said, But I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. So by his death, he ransomed us. He redeemed us. He purchased us by his blood. So Colossians 1.14 tells us, In Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So why rejoice in God through Jesus? Because through him we've been reconciled to God. And through him we have his peace. We are saved from his wrath by the gift of his son. Somebody said this, and I love this. The cross is the only ladder high enough to touch the threshold of heaven. That's how we got saved. God so loved us, he gave us his son. I, you, we who were at war with him, have heard his terms of peace. We have unconditionally surrendered. We are righteous by him declaring us to be so imputing to us that which belongs to him, which we don't deserve. And he's given us joy unspeakable and a hope. And even though we go through affliction, and we do, it produces in us the qualities and character traits, the fruit of God's work that we greatly desire. Why? Because as we go through the valley, we discover that we, can fe- we don't have to fear any evil. Why? Because he's with us. And we can turn around because there are other people who are also walking through that kind of valley. And we can say, he's with us. Follow me as I follow him. And we can walk together into the glory that God has prepared for us because of Jesus Christ. Our Father, we bless